capitalism in mean the narrow sense is no more because what capitalism does is that you may work in a steel mill and they outsource you and say you are a cleaner and because you're now a cleaner you get a lower rate and you must go to the cleaning workers union. We said no, we are not just a craft union. We will organize every worker who is in a steel mill is a metal worker. Yeah. The idea of industrial unions in more than 21st century doesn't work. And let me just give you an ex another example. We organize, you don't have it here in the US. We have 40,000 people who put gasoline in the car. And we fought against any automation of uh, petrol stations. Because that, for us, imp was important job creation. So we've got all these members, but they are organized by NUMSA. But the people who bring the petrol are organized by the chemical workers union. The people in the refinery are organized by another union. So we said, no, no, no. Bargaining times are different. Bargaining units are different. It is important for the working class to organize a long value chain. Right from where the, the crude arrives on the docks, through the refinery, through the wholesalers, right into retail. And we will go right up and organize in this manner. And in this way, Workers can have power and they can go out and strike at the same time without being fragmented. <laughs> now you are clapping for all of these reasons that we took. <laughs> yeah. But let me tell you these five reasons led to our expulsion from Gosar. Mm -hmm. Expulsion. On the 8th of November, The night of the long nights began. The meeting started at nine, and one o'clock it was announced the vote was taken that more than 360,000 members for taking these reasons were being expelled from Kosati. And this is a federation and a movement that we as metal workers have built. So we are out in the cold. We have been expelled from Kosati. And this was followed by the dismissal of the General Secretary of Kosati, who, I'm sure you've heard things about sex scandals and sex work in the office, decided that he will not support the expulsion of more than 306,000 members. And for that reason, he was expelled. Vavi, Vavi is no more the General Secretary of Kosovo. So the South African labor movement that was built to blood and sweat is de facto split. And no unionist here can rejoice at the split of unions because the beneficiaries are always the employers. But it is a fact that for the first time in this year, in Kosato's 30 years of existence, we've had two May days. Because in Kosato, which has 22 affiliates, there are 13 affiliates that said NUMSA must go, and there are eight other unions who said that we are standing by NUMSA. And those unions have decided not to participate in COSATO until NUMSA is reinstated. So what you have, you've got 13 versus 9 unions. And we are taking this forward, this, this part forward. Where it's going to end, it's not but one thing from our union is that the five resolutions that we took, which we had a mandate from our members, there is no turning back from those resolutions. It 
Kusatu must take us back with those resolutions as we've taken them. Because to change them, it means going to all the factories, canvassing those workers in China. So that's where we are now. And I'm sure I can take some questions on the United Front. But we have a clip here that's very short where the General Secretary was talking about what was happening just before the Congress. Just before the Congress. We do have another DVD about the Congress and the outcomes of that. I've also brought a DVD on Marikana for other time, not tonight, for another time to look at what exactly had happened, where workers were entrapped, basically entrapped and shot. And this was a clear collusion between the employers, which is a, a, a British multinational corporation, the ANC politicians who have shares in those companies, and the police. Let's, 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 let's see that. Of, 
of threat, we must impose export tax on our key strategic minerals. I mean, why should our national grid, for instance, suffer? We have we lost our competitive advantage on, on electricity. When in fact we got coal in this country, the national grid should be able to be supplied coal cheap so that as a country we can actually champion manufacturing and industrialization if we are to, to make sure that we deal with the scourge of poverty, unemployment and inequalities. that from since this existence we 
all is linked, sexual struggle with community struggle. It is time, therefore, to be more resolute, to be consistent. But if we want to succeed to do that, it's going to require that starting from a shop squad committee in the shop floor, to go to local shop squad council, to local office bearers, to the union nationally. If there's one thing that we must preserve as modern workers, is our own unity. If there is something that you do not like about any particular comrade, it's high time to sit down with him and talk to him. We can give the enemy no quarter. We cannot open up space out of differences that are not political. We can't be chasing lizards whose covenants are against us. And if we are to mobilize the working class, our unity must be served. <laughs> Metal workers own and control their money. And the only way they do that is to elect shop stewards that they trust. When those shop stewards are elected, they must basically operate on the basis of mandate and accountability. Shop stewards every day must address tea time, lunch time, general meeting. They, it can't be that a day can pass by. We have nothing to report when in fact workers have been problems in the point of production. Shop steward must continue to take up all those issues. They must attend local shop steward council, where well, that's where they can be able to share with other workers the frustration that they are experiencing in their, which are, are experienced by their members in their plants. Other shop stewards who come from different plants will help them to get alternative how to solve those problems. But also they must go beyond them, so they must attend Kosatu local shop steward council. Well, that's the only way we can be able to begin to hedge the night. But above all, you know, we all know that if you're not political, you're dangerous. There can be no revolutionary movement forward without revolutionary theory. All of us must be humble, we must serve the organization, we have been privileged. There's no bodies with the right to occupy any particular position in the union. We're making a contribution because workers for now have appointed us. We've got a duty to be humble. If you are an LOB, you're a regional leader, your duty is to make sure that you win hearts and minds of everybody, your staff, your team, and right from an administrator, all of us who must further the aims of the National Union of Metal Workers. And the, the, the beneficiaries of every effort when we are at work must be, must be metal workers in the shop floor. You are a loser shop steward if you work at the worker, if you work at BW, you are a loser shop steward if you are not a good leadership and the local and all of us who must prioritize the member. If in a particular plant there is a problem that is pending, local organizers can't go there when they do not know in their mind what do they think is the solution. In other words, before you visit a plant as a local organizer, at least in your mind you should have entertained what is it that you think is your solution. But having arrived in that short square committee, first that very short short square committee must be must work collectively, must, must work in a uniform fashion. If a shop steward has received a problem from workers, he must share that problem with the rest of other workers. And when they brief the local organizer, the local organizer must listen. What do workers think happens?
how that problem can be resolved. A combination of the local organizer, the local shop stewards, the views of members, must be able to give us a position which the union can approach management and to bargain for. When we finish to present to management, we must go back to workers and give them feedback. They must be part of the solution. NUMSA is a militant revolutionary union. NUMSA is a fighting union. You can't have shop steward, LOBs, local organizers working between management and workers without actually making sure that within no time, if management is stuck on it as well as address problems, they must follow the proper procedures and make sure that workers are given a strike that is basically protected and workers can use their power to embark on a strike action to defend their gains and to fight to improve their, their condition. That must be a holy task as we engage at the present moment. But we have set ourselves a target for 400,000 membership. We go all out, and I mean it to visit industrial areas, to recruit workers, to work on Saturday and Sunday, to have teams we work at night, because if you recruit garage workers, you can't actually think that they are so confident to open to join the union when the bosses intimidate them during the day. So during the night, you would have time to build their confidence, to explain their rights, because knowledge is power. All of us, we must stay to our hands. Make sure that there's no social distance between the union, shop stewards, the leadership of the organization. It's time to subordinate to members. And members must feel that they own and control their own union. But not for the sake of just owning. The union must address those immediate challenges that affect workers. We must give confidence to workers, such that workers are able to say, this union is my union. I've got these challenges. It is not yet addressed, but I've got confidence that it will indeed address this particular problem. you know what, what to do in South Africa, I know I'm just far away. We put uh, maybe three questions in one pot, we stir them up, and a skew comes out of that. So maybe let's take a, a couple, a few, yeah. and, then, and then we can all stir it up, and, uh, and we'll all find right. a, a great speed. Yeah. Gentlemen there. Yeah, can I make an announcement, uh, a question? Sure, go ahead. All right. Um, I just want to announce that on uh, the 29th, as part of uh, all U.S. and Puerto Rico actions in, the, in support of the freedom of uh, the political prisoner Oscar Lopez Rivera, which is one of the oldest uh, political prisoners in the hemisphere held on American prisons because uh, he fought for Puerto Rican independence and he has the support of uh, Nobel laureates such as uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu and Carlos Esquivel from Argentina and among others. So there's going to be a demonstration, you know, as part of the actions uh, in the Bay Area. One is San Francisco on Friday, May 29th, at uh, Powell and Market Streets in San Francisco to 5 p.m. till 7. As you know, Puerto Rico is an American colony, super exploited by Yankee and multinational corporations and uh, military. So it's the right of uh, the nation to uh, be independent. So we didn't uh, ask for solidarity, you know, as internationalists from the activists 
in the empire against uh, the occupation and against uh, oppression. So thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, any questions later, you can ask me. And I hope to see you there. Uh, and now my question. Uh, so I uh, noticed that uh, you said that uh, there is a discussion among the workers' movement, probably about forming, you know, eventually a party or something. Don't you think that uh, what has happened in South Africa is the policies of what is called the Popular Front, a multi so-called so multi-class uh, alliance that only uh, ties the workers, you know, uh, it, you know, it makes it impossible because uh, classes are antagonistic and uh, they cannot be conciliated. Do you guys uh, think about forming an independent party? that is only a workers uh, party with the uh, program of socialism. Okay, and I'll go back over here, but Steve? Well, uh, one of the things is uh, this issue of privatization, which is a big issue in, in the United States. So I know in, in South Africa, I was there a couple of weeks ago, the government is trying to privatize electricity, uh, they're trying to privatize everything in the country, and how are you fighting privatization? How do you see the fight against privatization? Is it's not just a South African issue. It's going on here with the post office and education and that kind of thing. So how do you see building a movement uh, against privatization uh, in South Africa and internationally? Because that really is lacking. So that's, that's one question. And the other question is the political vacuum that you have in South Africa. I mean, the, the, work, the majority of people vote for the ANC, although it, workers are becoming disenchanted. But how do you see the situation in the United States where there is no workers' party, you have the Democrats and Republicans, and they pretty much have the same program. Uh, do you see a similar kind of project in the United States as a way of taking the working class forward politically here? All right. Uh, let, me, let me take it just and see. Uh, and confess, uh, Stacy, that I'll use my... Catholic background. <laughs> and in the, we used to say, the last will be the first, and the first will be the last. So I'll start with the, the last question. <laughs> Let's, uh, 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 Steve, uh, uh, talk about, I'll start with the privatization and I'll be quick. The privatization in South Africa uh, was started before the democratic breakthrough, the elections in 1994. When apartheid saw that uh, they were coming, their reign was coming to an end, the first thing they wanted to do was to sell the family silver. And this was fought uh, very hard. When the ANC came into power, it wanted to continue with the program of privatization. And in 2000, 2002, we had two, three day general strikes to oppose privatization. So, the electricity utility in South Africa is still owned by the state. The transport network is owned by the state. There are about eight major utilities that were about to be privatized, which we defeated the ANC government from privatizing. There's been some deregulation. The problem that we, f we face in South Africa is not privatization, is how state-owned enterprises act like private companies. They are supposed to be owned by people, they are supposed to, to deliver services, but they are chasing bottom lines. We have today the issue of the electricity utility, which is called ESCOM, 
pushing up the issue of uh, electricity tariffs. And I will share with uh, you the photos. Yesterday, for the last five years, the electricity price in South Africa compounded has increased by 252. They are asking for 2015-2016 for a 25.3 increase, which means that ordinary people cannot afford electricity. And this is in the middle of winter. So yesterday we had a night vigil in Soweto, where we said under a slogan, imagine a winter with no power, fix the electricity crisis. And the grannies and the aunties and the women who the load shedding would affect were in this meeting and we said we'll do it outside, candlelight, as a symbolic way that load shedding, blackouts, must be, must be fought. And we are having a big conference on the 2nd to the 5th of, to define a campaign to fight a, a this uh, the, the blackouts. So, uh, privatization, yes, there's deregulation and all of that. The second uh, question of yours, Steve, and I know in the union movement, they always, you know, we never finish this question. Those you don't finish, you finish in the pub. That's now <laughs> the time. The, the second question, uh, 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 Steve, was about uh, what happens in, 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 in the U.S. I, I, I am a uh, uh, someone who uh, believes uh, in internationalism, but each country, uh, each section of the working class must find its own solutions. When I say that, I'm not saying it's not important. That there are things that are clear to me that uh, this ball that happens here between the Republicans and the Democrats is not helping the working class. Thank you. It's not helping the working class. You you are just about to get into another ping ball game. And I was sort of I was up in here reading all these newspapers. And when you listen sometimes you wonder now how what what's the difference between them? So I think you, as the working class here, must decide how you're going to do this. I know it's not easy. It's a big country. The level of unionism are not as high. And you have a history of struggle, but you also have a history where the left intestines of the labor movement have been taken out. The McCarthy laws, you had a good tradition, the emergence of the CIO in the 30s, and we know what happened. And unless say, a movement is built, and we were observing things here yeah, about what the unions were doing, what Occupy was doing, and all of that, it's clear to us that there is widespread 